All right, so we've started this new series, right? We've started a series on beliefs that change everything. I'm just calling it signposts. But this idea that, you know, you, it's, it's important to have signposts to help you understand how to navigate reality and move around correctly. And uh, last week we started with how it's helpful that to just uh, how it changes everything to just be aware that God exists. The God of the Bible, Father, Son, Holy Spirit that uh, uh, exists, and that's important. However, this morning, as, as we begin, as we go into this next step, I, I really want to talk about this idea of I, it's just not enough to talk about the fact that God exists. I used to find that I could have conversations. It'd be pretty easy to engage people that, that they'd want to know, hey, let's... Let's debate whether God exists. Let's, let's talk about that. But I believe most of people in the West, certainly here in, in Oregon, Washington area, that w- most people couldn't care less whether God exists. They just, they, it's not a debate. It's not a discussion. It's, it's, it's more of a fact of like it's irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. Uh, if, even if God did exist, I don't, I don't really like God very much. I don't like what he would be like. I, I don't want anything to do with it. I, I really just, I don't like the things that God likes. I don't dislike the things that God dislikes. I'm not really interested at all. Well, the thing is, is I believe a whole lot of that is based on a couple of misunderstandings. I don't think we have an accurate view. Most of the people, if, at least based on our uh, literature and movies and how it's talked about in the public, I don't think most people understand who God is. They have a very skewed vision of who God is. But even in the areas where it may be accurate, I think that vision of God, they, they, they misunderstand why God cares about the things he cares about. And so I want to, this idea that God would care at all, this is our next signpost, as a matter of fact, stayed specifically, God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I think that if you were to really believe that, if that were a sense of you, that, that it so accurately reflects reality, it would change everything for you. However, I think for the most part, this idea that, that God would care about and be involved in people's lives is not something that interests people. I had uh, read this week that on average, here in the United States, at least as best I understand, here in the United States, the average person commits about seven crimes a day. The average person is committing seven crimes each and every day. And what's interesting is you say that, and a lot of people go, yeah, you know, no, not, not me. So I want to start, if, if I were to sit there, I've got a list here, and, and we're, we're, this, is, this is the public participation part. According to this poll on poll1.com, uh, about seven laws a day, the seven ones, uh, let's talk about five, I, I've got a list of ten, top five, top five laws that are broken each day. What's your guess? Speeding is absolutely number one. Speeding is number one, not even close. What else? Passing through a stop sign. Nope, not on the top 10. It's a good, it's a good one. Seatbelt. Absolutely. That is interestingly, that, that's number 10. It's not top five, but uh, not wearing a seatbelt. About 18% of people do not wear a seatbelt. Um, there's a number, number of them are driving things, yes. Cell phone in the car. Texting, talking while driving. Number two, big one, not stopping. We just tried that one. Believe it or not, it's not top 10. Okay, number three, litter, littering, dropping litter. Number four, illegally downloading music. I don't think anybody downloads music anymore. I was actually surprised. Thought everybody just streamed music, but illegally downloading music. And then number five, riding a bicycle on the sidewalk. Yeah. So there are more. And so the thing is, is as we think about that list, I'm not going to ask you how many of those, you know, illegal parking, eating or drinking while driving. 
I don't know if you even know that. That's against the law in Washington. It's against the law to even do it. It's, it. They can't pull you over for it, but if they pull you over for it, they pull you over for something else, they can't get you for it. So as, as we look at this list, and I think about it, for the most part, what happens is as you begin to hear this list and go, oh, yeah, okay. Because uh, most people, uh, well, like I said, you know, there's, uh, there's about 53% of folks who say, you know, it's not, you don't really have to obey every law. I mean, there's a good 20% who will just say, it's okay because everybody does it. Everybody goes five miles an hour over. It's, it's no big deal. But, but of those, a uh, good 53% of people say, yeah, 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 okay. If the law is pretty minor, then it doesn't really matter. And so what we're hoping in the midst of that, we realize neither of those defenses would work in court. Neither of them like, oh, everybody does it, or it's just a minor one, it doesn't matter, would never work in court. So what are we hoping as we kind of continue our existence in life as the average American? We're hoping nobody notices. We're, we're hoping nobody actually pays attention that, 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 that the enforcement agencies, whether it's the police or whoever, that they wouldn't care or be involved in our daily lives. We want to scoot under the radar to not be noticed, to not be scrutinized. And I, I, I get a sense in many ways that's how we also view our relationship with God. That, that a lot of people say, you know, if God did exist, I don't know that I like him very much. And if I didn't like it, that, then I, I, I would just hope that he just doesn't notice. He just doesn't care. However, as I believe, as I've stated before, I believe that's a, a direct misunderstanding. It's because we don't believe. What? That would be good if he were involved. Here's what I figure. I figure there are some this morning who may be hearing this who are saying, you know, the truth is, is I, I don't really care. I don't, I don't care if God exists because I don't really like what God is portrayed as. And I want to tell you, I think this morning is for you. If that's you this morning, you need to hear these things about how we see God and who God is to truly overcome that hurdle. But I do believe there's a second category of people. These are people who are Christian, who do believe the things that God believes, but, but are frankly living their life terrified. That they're scared they're going to get caught. They're scared that they're going to be seen, that their failures are the mess up, that God is looking for a chance to give them the divine equivalent of a ticket. And if so, this morning's for you. Then there are also those, I think, in maybe a third category, where the truth is, is that you, you're not living scared. You're not worried that you, you do sense, uh, you have a correct understanding of who God is. And then this can be for you this morning as well as you just celebrate this reality. I think just remembering is in part what we do here each week. I realize as I preach, as I talk, all this information that I share isn't necessarily new to all of us. But sometimes it's helpful just to be reminded you know, last week when we had our fall kickoff and uh, you guys surprised me with a cake because it was 25 years since I've been here. And the thing is, is, I didn't go that, when I saw that cake, I didn't think like, oh yeah, I am here. That's true. I exist. Like that, that it was more of a reminder of like, yes, it's good to stop and pause and think about the good things that have happened over the past 25 years. And I think sometimes it's really good to just reflect, to hear the Word of God and go, yeah, I count on that, and that's an awesome thing. So, first point, first blank in your outline, to help us understand God, to be able to, to, to even want there to be a God that's involved and cares about my daily life, is to understand that God is good. All the time. God is good. Now, when I say that, though, it, it does kind of beg the question, what, what do I mean by good? And I, I'll tell you what I want it to mean. You know what I'd really like to mean when I say God is good? You know what I want that to mean? I want that to mean God will give me what I want when I want it. That's how I would really like to define good. I would like to define good as whatever I think I want. Well, no, 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 I'm smarter than that. I'm more mature. I wouldn't say what I want, what I need what I really need to live a full and healthy and authentic life, that God would give me that. And, and if God is good, he will give me what I need when I need it. And I would define it that way. That's how I'd want to define it. And the interesting thing is, 
God does do that sometimes. God does give wonderful and good and enjoyable blessings in our lives. And, you know, I, I think he's deliberate about it. You know, as I, I think about, I had this experience a couple weeks ago, there was this, the frosted mini wheats guy, the little frosted, and you, if you don't know what that is, that's probably good, but he's a little guy, and he's got these little, this is a little weird face, and he's a frosted mini wheat, and Rachel just thinks that's the funniest thing, so I, I cut it out of a box, and we put it up on the fridge just for her, and she just thought that was the funniest thing, just to have this. Now, now the thing is, is it's frivolous, and it's silly, but I enjoyed doing that. Why? Just because she enjoyed it, and that was enough for me. You know, I, I, I can enjoy getting gifts for Lisa. I can do that, not because I necessarily care about any of them, but because she does, and it brings joy to her. And, and the question is, does God ever get to do that with us? Does he ever get to just say, you know what? This will be kind of fun. I'll give him a good parking spot up front. Like, just to do that, because that would be fun. I think they'd enjoy that. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that God sometimes in trivial and small and maybe in some big ways that will provide and give us things just because it pleases him to do that. And, and there are blessings that we receive. And so sometimes God does it. And, and the thing is, is, we don't ever know. We don't really know. Was that just like coincidence that have something I really like or that God gave it and put it into my life and it's good? I don't know. But it, I don't know that it matters because we can still be thankful for it no matter what. Because if it is indeed a good gift, regardless of how it got to us, it got to us via God. James says it specifically, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God is good. It doesn't change. God is always good all the time. And because he is good, that, that he does want to bring blessing into our lives. And so we can be thankful that we got that job promotion or that, we, that the test turned out okay uh, at the doctor or whatever it is that we say, you know, this is a good thing. And we can be thankful for it. However, there's more to what God does. His goodness is not defined by always making sure I have what I want when I want it. In fact, he says something deeper here in Ephesians. This is uh, Paul talking about God to him. This is God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. He is able to do more than we could ask or imagine. What that means, you can't imagine, much less ask, for all the goodness that God wants to deliver to you. You don't have the capacity to ask or even imagine the goodness that God wants to do for you. I mean this in a couple of ways. Sometimes God will say no to things in our lives because he has something really good for us. Here's a trivial example. I remember uh, taking Lexi on one of her first times going trick-or-treating. We were down in Southern California, and we got her all dressed up as a ladybug, and, and, and she had her little, uh, you know, pumpkin bucket thing. And so she goes to the first house, as we tell her to, and say, okay, you got to ring the doorbell, and then you got to say trick-or-treat. And she rang the doorbell and just looked and couldn't figure out how to say trick-or-treat because she was just so stunned that there was somebody there. And she finally gets it out, and they put a piece of candy in, and she said thank you like she was supposed to, and then reached in and unwrapped the candy and just started eating it right in front of them. <laughs> and for us to go, no, 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 don't eat this now. Don't eat this now. Put this in. We're going to go to another house. But, but I want candy. But I want candy. No, no, no. We're going to do this, and we're going to trust us. Trust us. There's something so much better than that one piece of candy. Just keep Keep doing what I've asked you to do. And I know, I know what you want, when you want it, but trust me, just even a little bit of waiting, and you're going to enjoy this. And I wonder how many times God has been like, but God, God, I, I want that, and it's right in front of me, and why can't I have that? Because I've got a better plan for you. I've got something so much better for you. Just listen to me, and it'll be better. 
But the second thing is I think God is defining his good in a whole bigger way than I would. I often will define good as, 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 as the moment that I get what is nice. Wouldn't that be nice? I like nice things. Don't you like nice things? Don't you want a nice time? Wouldn't it be nice to feel nice? Like, really, when I say that, what I mean is I want to be comfortable. I want it easy and comfortable and and nice. And God doesn't seem to be as interested in my comfort as he is in my character. And says, Bill, no, the better life, the life I have designed to you, isn't just about nice. It's about you becoming And I want you to become. I want to work on your character and not just your comfort. And so there are times and there are things that I will have to sacrifice that that would otherwise be nice. Oh, that would be nice. I kind of like this. That God says, no, 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 Bill, I've got something bigger planned for you. I have character planned for you, and we're going to work on that. Now, the thing is, is I... We'd all be okay with that. I, I think we would, we would, well, here's the way to put it. I believe, if it were just about knowledge, that God would give you exactly what you asked for if you knew as much as he did so you knew what to ask for. God is good. But secondly, and well, maybe it's not even first and second. It's not like they build off of each other. It's like we're taking something and we're looking at different perspectives of it. The second part is to understand that God has a plan. God has a plan. Because the thing is, is life isn't just about us. It's about others as well. And that God's goodness is global. It's eternal. It's universal. He's interested in not only what is good for Sony, but what is also good for Bill. And not only what's good for Bill, but what's also good for Haley. And he is interested in how do I work that out so that goodness is extended. And and the truth is, is that sometimes you may be called on to sacrifice for the sake of that which is even greater. That God has a plan. In that he is moving, he is literally creating. You, you know in, the, in Genesis when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? When we use that phrase created in English, like it's, 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 it's a past tense verb. Like he, he gone and done it. He, he created, right? We, we say past tense. But in, in, in Hebrew, in my understanding, it's, it's, it's it, maybe a better way to say it, because we don't have that tense in English, is to say something that kind of, happened in the past but is continuing into the future so it may be a way of saying god had started creating the heavens and the earth god had created and will continue to create the heavens and the earth that that he this is still a work in progress that creating is still happening and god has a plan to bring us from where things were to where things will be he has this 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 whole plan and he wants to move it in those directions and you get to be part of that, and it's frankly, it's better. It's better. You know, there's a verse, a pretty famous verse that we say a lot of. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I have seen that on little plaques in Bible bookstores, and I've seen that on, like, people put it on their Instagram and just say, you know, I have plans for you, plans to not harm you, but, but plans to give you a hope in the future. And, and, and yeah, I mean, God, God has that, but let, let's look at the context of that verse, because I think this is so key. The context, to start just right before it, This is what the Lord says to you. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. It's verse right before. See, here's what happened. Is the nations, there were multiple times that they were basically conquered by Babylon and taken and put in and, 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 and exiled from their land, uh, taken to a foreign land. They were to live in Babylon. And they, so they had captured Jews and took them and made them live where they wanted them to live. There's this whole empire reason why they would do that and those kind of things, but they were conquered. And, and God's saying, look, 
Yes, it's going to happen. You will be conquered. You are going to have to, and, and it's going to happen for about 70 years. But after all of that, know that the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I so desperately long and want to have you move up and to have good things, and it's going to happen after some difficult times and some difficult stuff. And the thing is, is I think just about every one of us would be okay with that, knowing that we might have to sacrifice for the benefit of others. I mean, if I told you today that you could just give a quarter, and if you sacrifice a quarter in some indeterminate amount, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now, all your loved ones will have the equivalent of a billion dollars. Like we go, yeah, I'd do that. Or maybe, maybe, not, maybe money's the wrong way to look at it. Maybe time. If, 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 if you would just give up 15 minutes of your day today, we're going to find a cure for cancer. Of course, every single one of us would be like, yeah, I want that. Who wouldn't say that? That, that a little bit of sacrifice now worth a whole bunch later is fantastic, even if it's not just for me. If it's for everybody else, that would be great. But how do we make that calculation? We make that calculation, how much is the sacrifice now? How do I get from A to B? And then is B going to be worth it? How are we to know that? Well, we don't. We trust God to have that plan. And God does. The stuff we might be going through, I will bring to goodness for you, for others. Lastly, God cares about me. You are not a pawn in God's global plan. I need you to see that just because God has a plan, he's not just treating you as, oh, I'll just move this around and I'll get it. It's fine, fine. I'll I'll make this one person to just take a whole lot of crud in their life so that it'll be good for everybody else. Like, he doesn't just treat you as a pawn. It's indeed this desire that he cares deeply about you. Look, he says it's even more that you are prioritized even above some other things. Here's a passage in Matthew. I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or your drink, or about your body, what you wear. It's not, is not life more than food? The body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? You are much more valuable than these birds in God's eyes. You're so much more valuable, and and he cares for them. He's going to care for you. And so you don't worry about clothes and, and, and what you eat or drink or about your body. You don't worry about those things. Now, the thing is, is like if we take this out of perspective, that say, wait, wait, wait. Does that mean anybody who trusts in God will never have a want, will never have a need? That's not what that says. What it says, you can miss it. If you just hear, well, God takes care of birds and he feeds them and he closes clothes the valley, you know, gives them great raiment, but, and so he's going to give me all the clothes I want and all the food I want. Then you've missed this important part, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? God's saying, I've got so much more than just, like, don't worry about that stuff. I, I'll, I'll take care of you. I will give you everything you need to do everything I've asked you to do. Doesn't mean you're going to have everything you want. Doesn't mean you're going to even have all the things you think you need. It says, I will give you everything you need so that you can accomplish everything I need for you, from you. Because life is more. That God is saying, I got you. I got you. You understand? I've got this. And I will, every little sacrifice you ever make, I will make up for it. You will have more. You will have better. You will have the ultimate. I will make it right. Folks, if you decide to be on God's side, you win automatically. Here's what it says in Romans. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You get to win. You're on the winning side if you're on God's side. God is good. He's got a plan. It's going to be worth it. And ultimately, ultimately realize 
no matter what happens, the ultimate cannot be taken from you. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. Man, I think that captures a lot of fears right there. I know so many people scared of the idea of demons and scared of the idea of death and scared of the... I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will be able to separate you. You can already win with a good God who has a plan for your ultimate benefit. As a matter of fact, the way Paul writes about it just in a few verses before, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You are already winning. If you are willing to be in Christ, you get a win. You get a good God who's got a plan not only for your life, but a plan for everybody's and a plan for the entire world and a plan for eternity. And he guarantees on his honor and his character, it'll be worth it. And if you can trust in that, it'll change everything. Let's pray. Glorious God, I mean, at some level, I, I guess... I, you know, I want to wrap my head around this. I want to understand. I want to know your plan. I want to know why, and I want to know this. And, and I've got some qualms about the things you ask me to do or ask me not to do. And, and, and really, uh, these are just minor. And like, I've got all this list, but ultimately, Lord, it comes down to this. I'm not God, and you are. Am I willing to trust in your goodness? Not only your goodness for my life, but for the lives of those I love and even those I don't even know. I do trust you, Lord. Help me in my distrust. Help me to conquer this day as if it's true that you're good, that I will submit to your good commands, that I will submit to your good will for my life, that I will live in such a way that, that, that I will allow you to transform me because the nice things I think I have to give up are going to be worth everything as you form me into who you want me to be. Always connected to you. And none of it's going to compare to the glory that is coming. I give you my life. Forgive me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.